Our speaker today is Dr. Aaron, Aaron Lucius from the uh, Department of Chemistry, and his research is in the misfolding of proteins that uh, causes uh, various diseases in the human body. And I suppose, in terms of the humanities or humanness, the disease that I suppose we all worry about most, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, it seems to be a result of this, or a, a possible result, and something that, that uh, is very immediately threatening. And I won't do any more misfolding myself and let him unfold his various models uh, of research in this area. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for inviting me to give this, this month's Haddon Forum. Um, I am a, a biophysical chemist. My PhD is in molecular biophysics. Those two things sort of mean the same thing. At least in chemistry, they call me a biophysical chemist. And what that means, and why I want to tell you that, is that that means we sort of, we as a group, my lab I'm referring to now, sit at the interface between really physics, biology, and chemistry. And we can go ahead and incorporate mathematics in there to some extent, since the type of physics we do. Um, but what we find interesting are what we call motor proteins or nano machines. And I like to start a lot of these types of talks with this quote that was by Bruce Alberts uh, in 1998, as the year I started graduate school. Uh, he wrote that he was the president of the National Academy of Sciences. I think he still is the president. Let me just read that to you. It says, nearly every major process in a cell is carried out by macromolecular machines, protein complexes with highly coordinated moving parts driven by energy dependent conformational changes. And what he's getting at here is that up until this time, and maybe really 10 years prior to that, biochemists had always taken this reductionist approach. We still do take very much a reductionist approach, where we want to take an enzyme, and I'll explain what that means as we go, but whittle it down to its smallest active component and study how that works. And in, in going forward from where we were there in 1998 was recognizing that most things that happen in the cell require larger assemblies to catalyze some sort of important reaction. And failing of these systems often result in disease. And so I, we like to think about cells as these very uh, complex aggregations of uh, machines. And that's what this illustration is supposed to point out. And this, this represents a number of different types of machines. And what's fascinating about this, I find, is that you can think about the sort of real world mechanical processes that we see every day, driving of pistons in a car, or what goes on in factories as, as going on also at the nanoscale. And so the nanoscale, I have a couple of bars on these 25 nanometers, uh, 25 or two nanometers, keeping in mind now that this distance is um, equivalent. So if you took a human hair, and this is an example from one of my students, Elizabeth back there, a human hair at 80,000 nanometers it would take to span the width of a human hair, all right? So we're talking about a very, very small, uh, uh, scale here. You can't see with the naked eye, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So these are all models based on uh, structural studies, based on in-solution studies, based on a lot of indirect sort of studies that we do. And so let me show you, briefly overview some of these things. And so the, the energy source in the cell for all these processes is ATP, and most of us have probably heard of ATP. ATP is an energy storage molecule that gets broken into ADP, and energy is liberated and captured by these motor proteins. This F0, F1 ATPase actually uses a proton flow through this uh, motor here, and this motor turns, and as it turns, it binds to ADP, inorganic phosphate, and converts it back to ATP, producing energy for the cell, a storage molecule for the cell, all right? And so this proton flow, you can think about this, these are hydrogen atoms that have lost their electron, and so they have a positive charge. You plug, I, uh, <coughs> you take a power cord and plug it into that light socket over there, where essentially collecting a flow of electrons, negative charges, but the opposite also works. So if we have a flow of positive charges, this is a current in essence, all right? So we have a current flowing through the system that turns this thing and drives the production of these ATP molecules. Same sort of thing occurs for cell motility. In cell motility, now what you're looking at here is this large machine sitting in the cell membrane, and the proton flow through this causes this bottom part to rotate in the direction that arrow is saying. Attached to that that you can't see is a very long flagella. It's flipping around in solution. It's driving a bacterial cell cell to cruise around in, in, in solution in some way. All right, and so very mechanical processes. Now the type of motors I'm going to tell you about today that we're interested in are these ATP-driven machines. And here it is sort of what it looks like. You have a a motor protein with two little feet that's on this track, and it's walking down 
this track all the way down along, say, axon of a cell. You have a nerve cell in your brain, extends all the way down to maybe my finger. It allows me to do something like this. Well, your body can't rely on diffusion of small molecules all the way down here to get that process to happen as fast as I'm doing it, right? Which is not very fast, but fast enough. Now, what this does, these are little cargo packages attached to this, the, the rear of this, this protein complex is now stepping along this lattice and carrying neurotransmitters and things like that all the way down the axon so that it can do its, its role. And so it's very much like a real world type sort of transportation, if you will. These things now move on the order of thousands of nanometers per second so they can carry all this cargo stuff down to the end of the axon. Your muscle contraction, you know, moving my arm, works in the same way, so this is a schematic of muscle here. And a small blow up that, of that would show us that there's these stationary sort of rods we'll think of for now. And then these other uh, rod with these protuberances sticking off of it, and what those protuberances are now are going to attach to this and really just ratchet that along, right? So when your muscle contracts, all these little heads sticking off here are pulling on that, and they generate just a little, little tiny bit of force, right? Newton, uh, Newton meters of force, uh, sorry, piconewtons of force, the units don't matter. It's small, suffice it to say, right? It's a sum of all of those pulling forces that allows you to pick up some sort of weight or move in the way that we always do, right? So all these things are going on at the cellular level, all right? And so I wanna, I'm gonna give you a bit of a biochemistry background lecture so I can get everybody to sort of the same place where proteins and things like that come from. Most of you, if not all of you, have seen some sort of, sort of picture of a cell like this. And this sort of picture of the cell was sort of stuck in my head until maybe about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. When I, somebody pointed out to me that, well, it's not quite that empty. So you look at that picture of the cell, which you probably saw in sophomore biology at some point, and it looks very empty. Not a lot going on. There's some organelles, your nucleus, this and that. The reality is that the cell is an extremely crowded place. Right? It's packed full of proteins. And so that's why you need those transport molecules, or another reason why you need those transport molecules is because if some, these proteins are not going to diffuse very far on their own in solution. If you take a glass of clean water and some blue food dye, right, and you drop that in there, you can watch that blue food dye move out fairly quickly because there's plenty of space for it to diffuse into. In the cell, that diffusion reaction doesn't really happen. So things have to be actively moved. And I'm going to come back to that idea of a crowded environment. This is actually a painting um, from David Goodsell. This was uh, pointed out to me by one of my other students, Justin Miller, in the lab. Um, and this, this is his website. He's got a lot of paintings of different biological systems and they're kind of cool to use, especially for a talk like this, right? All right, so this is my, my biochemistry primer. All right? So it's gonna be a real sort of brief overview of, you know, everybody knows at this day and age, or at least has heard of, DNA, right? All organisms have DNA and, and proteins, and these are polymers, all right? So it's a polymer. Well, a polymer is just a, a um, large molecule made up of simple repeating units, okay? And those simple repeating units in the case of DNA are these single bases, A, G, C, T, and you've all probably seen those someplace repeated. Gattaca, the movie, spelled out a word, an alleged word. Um, and, but if we look at a polymer chain, this is DNA and this is RNA, I'm not going to talk much about RNA per se, they're essentially the same. All right? Ribonucleic acid just has a hydroxy here, DNA has that hydroxy missing, but for this talk it doesn't matter. But the important point is, is that you have this repeating chain of sugar backbone, phosphodiester backbone, we call it. That's, you can see it's the same, right? So you have this five-membered ring, these phosphates, and each one of those repeats with uniform repetitions. Now, on the sides are what are called bases, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and adenine, and those are different, right? Which gives rise to different chemical properties in each of these bases. Now, if we look at this structure, this you know, this is the DNA that everybody's seen before, right? The double-stranded DNA. What we have is that phosphodiester backbone going in opposite directions, and you have these interactions between the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's. And so what you have with DNA is you have these favorable interactions. It's actually in opposite polarity. So you have these double, this double-strand structure. And so you have what's called a double helical structure, okay? And DNA is the, the uh, information storage molecule, right? It encodes for proteins. And the proteins are what we're really interested in here, right? So proteins also um, polymers, but they're made up of uh, 20 different amino acids. So DNA is, is a polymer again, and it encodes for 20 different amino acids. So each reading of three different nucleotides in that double strand DNA encodes for an individual amino acid, okay? And so amino acids are basic building blocks of proteins. 
it too forms a polymer. And so if you can look here, what's in gray here is what's constant, right? So that's that backbone that will form. If you look, it's a little bit small, but the COO will interact with this H3N plus. And if you link those all up across here, you'll have a polymer chain again. And sticking off the side are chemical groups that are different, right? So this is uh, something that is, is very hydrophobic. That is, it doesn't want to be near water. It'd rather be near something greasy, right? So if we really linked all these things up, that chain would tend to want to dissolve in olive oil instead of water, right? And now, so you can, you can imagine now, if we link up these amino acids in a variety of different sequences, okay, we're going to have a strand. We're going to have a strand. We have some string for other purposes, but we would have a strand of protein up there, up sticking off of the side would be side chains that have various different chemical properties. And the consequences of that is that proteins will fold. Things that are hydrophobic, like in the top, right, greasy, if you will, they're going to want to be next to each other. Things that are charged, like down here, positive, sorry, you can't really see it that well in this light, but these are charged, and charged things are going to want to face water, for example, right? This gives rise to, gives rise to very regular sorts of structures and proteins. And I'll come back to this particular slide to explain these proteins later, but what I want to illustrate at this point is the general structures of proteins that form are called alpha helices. This right here, this structure looks like a spring, right? And beta sheets, and these little arrows that you see here, those are called beta sheets, right? But proteins, as a consequence of those chains that are sticking off the side, adopt very specific structures, and therefore, that very specific functions, right? So the structure that we have gives rise to a particular function, okay? All right. So now I've told you about two of the main polymers in a cell. And we want to put those two things together in our biochemistry primer here and say, OK, well, what, what the central dogma of molecular biology says is that we have DNA, and that's an information storage molecule. Okay? And it gets replicated every time the cell has to replicate. How do we get that information out? Well, we get that information out through transcription, if you have. Make the word makes sense, right? We want to get the information out. We would go to it, take a pen and paper, and write down the sequence, right? That's how we transcribe something. Now, that gets transcribed as an RNA molecule for the purposes of this. That's very much like DNA. It's just a copy of what's in the DNA. And now, that RNA gets translated ultimately into a, into a protein, okay? And so this is a movie of, of all of that. A lot of work goes into this line of structural biology techniques and solution techniques from fluorescence to single molecule biophysics. Uh, to a lot of things that we're going to talk about that we do today as well. So let's look, take a look at this. So what's going on here is some proteins are binding. Okay, there's my first, hopefully my first mistake. Oh, my. Okay, that's why I have the other laser. This one for some reason stops the movie. Huh. All right, so proteins are, are binding to DNA. This is a long double-stranded DNA that you're seeing here. So these proteins are binding, and this is called initiation of transcription. And so a polymerase, which is responsible for that transcription, um, is going to bind, and there he goes, right? So he, he goes ripping off down the DNA, and what he's doing as he goes down the DNA is he's breaking open that double strand and very rapidly essentially writing down what's in there. Okay? He's doing that with, with RNA, so it's... it's uh, this is forming what's called a messenger RNA, and this is the message or the transcript. And what's happening here is, is very rapidly, these bases are going in as single bases. They associate with the DNA, and the polymerase is linking them up into a long polymer chain. And that's what you see spewing out here, all right? So it's going long. The DNA snaps shut immediately behind it, because that's a very favorable thing for the double-strand DNA to come back together. And now, ultimately, what we will end up with here in a moment, when it's done, and all those are, again, the, these individual bases, the A's, the G's, the C's, and so on, going in there and being linked up to form this polymer chain, which ultimately is the message that's going to diffuse out and be translated into a protein. And so there it goes. And now it's done. And that's just going to diffuse away. Go How ahead. much slower is this uh, simulation than real time? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. So it happens at um, about 45, uh, 45 nucleotides per second. Um, so quite a bit, maybe. Because yeah, I, I don't think we're seeing quite that, that, that fast, right? All right, this is just a, the movie from this uh, site. It comes as two parts, and I don't know how to link them up. But basically, so now this RNA is going to diffuse away, and it's going to be bound by, or it's going to bind 
to a ribosome. So a ribosome is responsible now for this translation step, for the conversion of that D, uh, RNA message into now a protein. And so what's happening here is it's going along and these little molecules that you see diffusing around are called transfer RNAs. And so we call them tRNAs. Those tRNAs have on them an amino acid, all right? And at the bottom of it, the transfer RNA it matches this sequence that's on this RNA that's being fed into the ribosome, all right? So tRNA comes in and binds, and then the next one binds and the amino acids are put together by the ribosome. It's very similar to the polymerase making a long RNA strand, but now we're making a new protein strand, right? And that's what you see emerging out here in red, right? So that protein's just emerging out. And this goes at about 15, um, yeah, 15 amino acids per second, so it's about threefold slower than the translation process. Again, so you're seeing three, what we call three nucleotide codons bind to the tRNA, and now these tRNAs, this is just illustrating, it's gonna show you in a second the little red amino acid stuck on the end. Right, so there's the amino acid. Uh, each, so for the 20 amino acids, each of the 20 amino acids has its own specific tRNA that it uses then to associate with that ribosome and synthesize a protein. All right, so now what we're looking at now is the emergence of a new protein, polypeptide chain, if you will. Uh, again, linking up 20 different amino acids in some random order. But what this protein is now doing is it's searching what we call conformational space because those chemical moieties that are sticking off to the side, they want, some of them want to be close to each other, some want to be close to solution. Um, so it's, it's folding up. And what you saw just happen there is it suddenly got constrained, right? It's now found some favorable conformation it's going to prefer to be in. Continues to go on, and now you have these various structural motifs form, and it's going to release the protein. And it's, it's now has adopted some favorable confirmation. The reality of this is that that messenger RNA would actually lose the protein, diffuse off and do its thing. All right, the messenger RNA would actually have many ribosomes lined up on, just zipping through and producing protein after protein after protein. Okay. All right, so. That's the, continuing on with the, the biochemistry primer. Now, the protein adopts certain secondary structures. Um, the orientation of certain amino acid side, side chains results in active sites now. All right? And so what I want, the point I want to make about active sites, which is going to be important about when I talk, important for when I talk about the work that we're doing, is that certain residues now will fold into a region that will favor catalyzing a specific reaction. All right? So proteins catalyze reactions, those are enzymes. So I've mentioned enzymes already, but we're, I'm an enzymologist. I call myself many things, I suppose, but that's one of them. Um, in summary, an enzyme is responsible for bond making and bond breaking. We looked at the, I, I said that the, the, that COO minus could interact with that NH3 to form a bond, and we form a long protein. A polymerase then comes along and breaks that bond, right? So the polymerase is the enzyme that breaks that bond and breaks it back down into amino acids. So proteases uh, cleave the protein backbone. That's that enzyme that cleaves the protein backbone. For this discussion, what will be important as well is that their motor proteins, the motor proteins that we're interested in, couple the energy from cleavage of a bond in ATP to mechanical work, all right? So this is an ATP molecule. I said at the beginning, I showed it to you. So this is the, that, that sugar region. This is the, the adenosine base. That's the A. And the T stands for tri and P for phosphate. So adenosine triphosphate because we have these three phosphates. And it is the cleavage of this bond that releases energy, okay? So motor proteins bind to this molecule, cleave, orient that phosphate in an active site and catalyze cleavage of that bond. And that energy that is liberated then is captured in some way in the protein structure. The way Bruce Albert said it at the very beginning was um, the conformational changes, all right? So if we think of one of those structural elements as being like a spring, it's a little small, it's the only one I could find this morning, I just thought of this. Um, but when you, you hydrolyze that ATP, you can think of it as sort of bending that spring. And now you have some potential energy in there. That's that conformational change. So that's stored in there. And maybe upon release of ATP, that spring goes like that. And it moves the motor protein or does some other sort of mechanical work. Okay? So think of that as a loaded spring. If you compress a spring, the same sort of idea. right? Um, all right, so ATP, again, is that energy. It's going to be broken down into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So I will say those things throughout the talk. Some of this is to 
to um, define my language as well. All right. So this is another example. This is another DNA motor. It's a little bit blurry, um, but you have what you have here. This is actually DNA replication, as it turns out. That other part of the, the central dogma. You have double-stranded DNA coming into what's called a, a, a ring helicase. And the, the job of the helicase is only to use energy to break the double strands apart. Because anything that you, any um, process that requires getting information out of the DNA first requires opening of it. In the case of replication, we have to re replicate everything that's in the DNA. So therefore, we have to have some way of opening it up because it's very energetically favorable to close it up. Okay? And so what's going on here is that helicase at the front on the laser pointer is going along, and this happens at about 1,000 base pairs per second. Um, what, you, what you're not seeing is multiple cycles of ATP binding and hydrolysis and, and motions that are causing this to run along the DNA and, and break it open. Okay? Other things going on here that we're not going to really get into is just replication of, you're replication, replicating this single strand into a double strand and this single strand into a double strand so that the cell, for example, can replicate. All right, so some of the point of this movie, these movies so far, is to both give you the, uh, an idea of where DNA and proteins come from, what they do, as well as examples of motor proteins and why they're important, okay? And so another place that I mentioned are these transport motors. So now this is kinesin on a microtubule, okay? And so kinesin, again, it's that, that protein that can just walk along this lattice. This lattice here is a microtubule, binds to that, okay? And through repeat rounds of ATP, hydrolysis is hydrolyzed to ADP. Right, changes these conformations, which favors swinging the other subunit out and reattachment to the, to the microtubule. Again, this is all happening very, very much, much faster than we're actually seeing here. Okay? The other thing the, the ATP is doing in these different binding states, um, I think it's going to repeat. That won't. Yeah. All right, so you have ADP bound, and that's going to favor binding to the microtubule. So the, the thing that the, the hydrolysis states, whether you have ADP bound or ATP bound to those subunits, is telling the protein whether or not it should bind tightly to that lattice that it's translocating on. So it also modulates binding to the lattice and release of the lattice, right? Because you want to be able to do this. You don't want to just be stuck there, right? You have to be able to bind it tightly, do a walking step, release it, and then bind again. Doing that, right? so you have to go through cycles of weak binding and tight binding. All, right? all of that comes from solution phase biophysics, that is figuring out how ATP modulates the binding activity. Okay. All right. So now I want to get into, with that, I want to get into the work that we're doing. And so we're interested in a motor protein that's called a molecular chaperone. Okay. And so molecular chaperones, there's two types really. Those that aid in protein folding, and then there's those that unfold proteins, and now you should say, come on, Lucia, stop it. You just told us that fold is important. Why on earth would you want to unfold a protein, right? That doesn't sound like it makes any sense. Well, the reason we want to unfold proteins is that we want to deliver them to a protease for cleavage. That central dogma of molecular biology tells us that, well, the DNA encodes for a protein, and for example, if you're suddenly exposed to a particular type of sugar, we just had lunch, maybe you're you're, uh, you have some sort of sugar in, in lunch, don't know what it is, maybe fructose or something like that, your cells see that there's an influx of that type of sugar. Then what the DNA, or what proteins do to the DNA is they say, okay, we need to upregulate the proteins that degrade that type of sugar. All right, so it starts upregulating, making proteins to break that sugar down, does it until the sugar concentration goes down. And then when that sort of type of sugar is gone, then it feeds back to the DNA and says, okay, stop making the protein, all right? But it can't really stop there, right? That's analogous to if I went into my bathroom and I started the tub running and my mom called and I got on the phone. That's going to take about an hour and a half probably. And I went and sat down, got a cup of coffee and started talking to my mom because she lives in Washington. And then I get off the phone and I go back. Oh, no, you know, I let the tub and the tub's been running. You know, there's water everywhere. So my solution is turn it off, right? Take my bath and be done with it. Well, it doesn't end there, right? I have to clean up all that water. And so you can't just keep overexpressing proteins and be done with it. You have to get rid of them. And the machine that is responsible for getting rid of them are ATP-dependent proteases. Okay? So these proteases exist in the cytosol. You can't have proteases running around chopping up protein as they feel free to do either, because that would be bad as well. And so they're, they're regulated by ATP, by motors that translocate a protein or drive a protein into it for degradation. Right? Right. 
So removal of those proteins are no longer needed. Uh, remodeling of stable complex, I'm going to skip over these because I can better express it with this illustration. All right. And so most of the time, these are the ATP dependent proteins, and I'll explain that in a moment. Most of the time, we're happily sitting around our cells are with native proteins, that is, they're folded, and everything's fine. Okay? But every now and then, we get hit with some heat, some high temperatures, or some sort of shock, or we've been sitting at the bar too long the night before. That is, if you squirt bacteria with, back, with uh, alcohol, right, that tends to kill them. That's one of the ways we can clean up the surface, right? So if they've been drinking too much, then that's some sort of shock that causes unfolding of proteins, right? A little bit of stress is okay. We've been out in the heat, maybe we've been a little bit of heat shock, we have to regulate some proteins that deal with that, that's fine. Or they spontaneously just go back to this native state, right? Proteins tend to unfold at high temperatures. <coughs> unfolding is bad. Now, if the heat shock is too extreme, uh, then these proteins will tend to interact with each other because you've exposed faces of those proteins that don't want to be in, in liquid water, for example. They want to interact with each other. Once that aggregation process starts, that can be bad, especially for humans, because we don't have a mechanism for reversing it. So we form these aggregated proteins. Aggregated proteins can exist in a solution, but they also can tend to crash out, right? Meaning they precipitate. That's what I mean by precipitate. Think about you know, super saturating a glass of water with, with sugar, right? You can put a lot of sugar in there, and then you can boil it and even get more sugar in there and let it sit around for a while and you form rock candy, right? Because the, the sugar is precipitating out of solution. But when these proteins start to precipitate out of solution in our brains, that's called neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and prion diseases like uh, mountain cow disease and those types of things, right? We don't have a mechanism for disaggregation that's known anyway. No, it doesn't look as though we have any proteins that are so, similar to proteins that do exist in, say, plants and bacteria. Nobody really knows why this is. Plants and bacteria have proteins that can deal with those sorts of aggregates and make them into just unfolded proteins that then other proteins can come along and, and fold them back to their native state. It makes some sense, I suppose, because if you're a tomato plant, you're stuck in a pot, right? You're watching the sun go over. You can't do a whole lot about it. You're just going to heat up on a really hot day, right? So you've got to have proteins that sort of deal with that sort of thing. Right? We, on the other hand, go, I'm going to go get some shade because it's hot, right? <clears throat> so then that makes some sense. But the problem, it doesn't work when we start talking about the disease states that, that occur later. All right, so um, when we have these unfolded or misfolded proteins, there's a, what we call this kinetic competition. I, I should point out these authors call this the protein quality control triage. Chaperones can bind to these unfolded proteins, and we have these in human systems when they're still in solution, help them refold back to their native state. And so these are the same sort of proteins, all right? Now, the other thing that could happen is it can bind to these ATP-dependent proteins. Okay? And so what you're looking at here in blue is a chaperone. And what that is is a motor protein, very much like that helicase I described. But its job is to bind to a protein and pull it into this green cavity here. And inside that green cavity is, is a protease active site, right? So it translocates or pulls protein down in there, and that protein gets chopped up. My lab likes to call this a molecular paper shredder, right? This is another term that I think Justin Miller coined in my lab. Um, but the idea is, right, you plug it, the paper shredder component in, and it pulls the paper in, and feeds it over some blades and chops it up. Same idea, right? The energy here, of course, is ATP hydrolysis, drives translocation into that cavity ultimately chopping up that protein into short peptides or individual amino acids that can be recycled by the cell for other processes. Okay. All right. So this is a schematic of the ATP-dependent protease that we worked on in my lab. It's called clip AP. And this is, this is from crystal, uh, X-ray crystal structures, and I'll explain a little more in a moment. But here on the left, is that, that proteolytic component. And what this is made of is, so what I will call a, a single protein chain or single polypeptide chain, we'll refer to as a monomer, all right? And so six, or sorry, seven of those monomers come together to form a ring, and then two of those rings come together to form this large barrel structure. You form a ring by seven monomers, you have a hole in the top. That hole in the top's not shown here, but I'll show you in a moment. But inside of here now, because there's 14 subunits, there's 14 of these protease active sites inside of that are there to chop up that protein when it arrives, all right? The, on top here is a motor, that's clip A, and that motor is an assembly of now six monomer units of clip A, again forms a ring, has ATPase active sites, and its job is to pull that polypeptide chain into this cavity. Now, acro across organisms, humans, plants, bacteria, 
they all have similar sorts of enzymes. Architecturally, they're the same. Proteolytic component flanked by either one motor protein or two motor proteins. Why two? Nobody seems to be able to ever answer for me when I ask them, other people in this field, I still don't know why. We're trying, that's an active area for us, is to understand, because when I look at this and I think, okay, I'm gonna drive translocation of a substrate from this end, and I'm gonna drive one from this end, the first thing that comes to mind is clog, right? And, and I don't know how it gets, gets out the other end, so it's not clear um, what's going on there, but that's, but that's good, because that gives me more reasons to argue for grant money and so on and so forth, right? All right, again, the same across organisms. We have the same thing in, in, in humans, so we use this as a model system. This is a summary of the functions of some of these proteins that we're interested in. This is clip AP. This is showing now just the one-to-one -one complex where clip A is in blue and clip B is in orange. Recognizes specific tags on proteins and chews them up ultimately, I've already said that. Now, clip B or HSP-104, again, plants and bacteria have these enzymes and their job is to disaggregate recognizes aggregates, resolubilizes them, probably other chaperones come in and help fold them properly. This is of interest to HSP-104, comes from plants, uh, clip B is the bacterial homolog. This is of interest to us because one, um, this type of enzyme has been introduced into uh, mouse models of a disease called Huntington's disease, and Huntington's disease is a, a protein aggregation disease, and it's been shown you can take the plant version of HSP-104 that mice don't have, introduce that gene, and when they have those aggregates show up in their cells, the HSP-104 will unfold it and reverse the aggregation and thereby reverse the disease. And some people think that this may be a way to treat some of these protein aggregation diseases. It's been shown that it doesn't work for Parkinson's disease. It's not clear why. Uh, a lot of questions still remain about how this enzyme works. We started with clip A. Um, because a lot more was known about it, and it too is functional in the absence of a protease. I don't think I said this. This doesn't interact with any known protease, all right? So you can't use degradation to monitor it. What do I mean by that? Well, if you want to study how these proteins pool on a polypeptide chain, right? Well, if you put the protease there, then the chain gets chopped up. Let's look at this one, all right? So if I have a string and I'm going to pass it through this ring, right? This ring. Pass through, I said, you know, did that string pass through the ring? Maybe. Right, well, if I turn around. <laughs> did it pass through? Or, or better yet, did, which one of these pass through, right? We don't know, right? Because it's not modified. There's no, there's no clear, there's no information in the string about whether or not it passed through the ring or not, right? So if clip B, HSB 104, or clip A, in the absence of the protease, translocates these, we need specialized techniques to be able to see it. Right? Now if I take a cigar cutter and put it on the opposite side of my ring, I do like this, right? And somebody else will probably have to help me because I only have two hands. And we passed it through, and we end up with a pile of chopped up strings and a pile of non-chopped up strings, and you'd say, well those clearly pass through the ring. Um, so the, and that's typically what's been done in this field to understand the motor compo components is to look at proteolysis and infer information about translocation or pooling on that polypeptide chain. Right. And I'm going to come back to that. I've got a little head in terms of what I talk about. Uh, we'll come back to that. The other, so the clip A will also translocate proteins uh, in the absence of protease. One of its roles is to take an inactive protein dimer, pull on maybe one of the tails, and cause it to form two active monomers. So it's a regulatory protein as well. I mentioned some of these, but these, these proteins now are, are involved in protein misfolding diseases prion diseases like mad cow, um, somehow those, those aggregates um, evade these protein quality control checkpoints in some way. Uh, misfolded proteins can get targeted to the proteasome. Now the proteasome is just a human version of that <coughs> same protein I've just described. So sometimes what goes wrong, in, in the case of cystic fibrosis, a particular protein that is important and necessarily gets targeted to the degradation pathway and gets removed, so it's not there to serve its normal function. Alzheimer's, which everybody's familiar with, right, also deposits of protein aggregates and maybe some way we can disrupt these using these types of proteins. Uh, various cancers are also the consequence of, of protein misfolding. Right, Huntington's disease I, I mentioned as well. So briefly, uh, I mentioned a couple times that structural biology or x-ray crystallography in this case is also one component of, of what we use to try and understand what's going on with these systems. And so this is just the crystal structure of clip B 
crystal structure of clipe. They're very highly homologous. They have similar sort of domains, this N domain and purple, nucleotide binding domain one in green, and nucleotide binding domain two in blue here, all right? So they both have two ATP binding hydrolysis sites. The difference between clipe is it has this N domain, at least structurally, all right? But they both form hexameric rings. And in large part, what's known about the mechanism of translocation for clip B is really inferring information from clip A. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that. All right, so that's just the, this is a model of what the ring would look like. Proteins are translocated through that central channel. That's just the side, you've already seen that, the side of clip, clip P, that's the proteolytic component. There's the central pore, which proteins are translocated into. That pore has a diameter of 10 angstroms, that's one nanometer, right? So very small. Uh, distance that we can't see with the naked eye. We can see that with X-ray crystallography. All right. All right. So the, these proteins function as hexameric rings. Um, the questions, and now I'm getting at specifically to our research, is is how do they, they assemble in hexameric rings? And these are questions of thermodynamics. If we think about, you know, if we had six tennis balls and I tossed them on the table, are they, they're not going to spontaneously assemble into a ring, right? They're just going to sort of scatter across the table, right? In solution there are driving forces that push these proteins together. There's charged molecules around, there's patches on the protein that favor interaction points, but the question still remains is how do they come to this assembly process, right? The other questions we're interested in is how do they, they recognize uh, the binding sequences that they're supposed to bind to. Imagine that you're a protein unfoldase that is supposed to unfold proteins, interact with specific sequences. In this very crowded environment of the cell, you have to be able to distinguish between are you somebody I want to fold? Are you somebody I want to fold? Right, you have to figure out who it is. Okay? And the question is, how does, it, how does it confer that specificity? So those questions are what we're interested in as well. And then finally, this translocation mechanism. <clears throat> For any sort of motor, right, if you built an engine, you would want to know how fast it could go. Right? You would want to know how much energy it uses up per turnover of the engine. Right? Same sorts of questions we're interested in at the molecular level. How much energy does it take? to turn over the engine, how far does it go per turnover, how fast is it. One of the things we're interested in for these proteins in solution, because it's like they're in three-dimensional space, is how precessive it is, right? If I'm a motor protein, I've got to carry that cargo down long distances of that um, uh, microtubule, then I need to be able to stay on that track, because if I fall off, I'm going to diffuse away, and that's not very efficient, right? So we're interested in questions of precessivity. <coughs> As I said before, we can't just look in a light microscope because the scales are way too small. We need specialized techniques. These enzymes are in the range of 17 by 8 nanometers. And just to reiterate, right, the thickness of a human hair is about 8,000 nanometers, so not a scale we can look at okay, in, in a light microscope. We use electron microscopy, uh, but we can't really watch things move around in, in electron microscopy. Right? So that's a limitation. So we have to have specialized techniques. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of our techniques, and then I'm going to try and wrap it up so we still have time for questions. All right. But it, even a task as simple as determining concentration, how much enzyme do we have in the little tube, uh, requires a specialized technique. And that specialized technique is UV absorbance. All right. So if you imagine if you have a glass of water, again, back to the dropping of, of blue food coloring into it, right? If I put one drop and let that mix up, it's going to be so dark, put another drop, gets a little darker, another drop a little darker. Same principle, right? If we put more and more protein into solution, <coughs> it doesn't get any darker to our eye, but it absorbs more and more ultraviolet light. So we use ultraviolet light. We can shine ultraviolet light on this shows all, all colors, but really we're going to be down here. But we shine light through that, and we can detect how much protein is there, right? So optical absorbance, excuse me, ultraviolet absorbance tells us about how much protein is there. And the reason I'm going to tell you that, really, is to tell you this. So how does clip A assemble? That's one of the questions we had very early on. And this question really was born out of this question, that is how does clip A recognize and bind to proteins in that crowded environment of the cell? When, we, when I first started, probably like most new assistant professors, I sat down and I read everything I could on clip A and clip A, P, and so on and so forth. And the literature said, look, clip A forms hexamers if you put a lot of ATP there. So as long as it binds to ATP, it's going to be hexamers. In the absence of hexamers, it's going to be monomers and dimers, so two monomers coming together to form a dimer. And I said, okay, that's great. Now we can address the question of specificity because the field is saying, we don't understand how it picks a sequence to bind to. I said, that's a thermodynamic question. I'm a thermodynamicist. I'm going to answer that question. All right. Well, the very first experiment we did, again, something that probably happens to everybody in science, didn't look like 
it was all hexameric and didn't look like it was monomers and dimers. So we said, okay, let's go look at, let's back up, look at the assembly state and see if it really is monomers and dimers and subsequent hexamers. And so to, to address this, we use a technique called analytical ultracentrifugation. Right? It's a bit of a busy slide, but it's a fairly simple idea. You have a rotor here, and this rotor is spinning out, out of the plane of the board in this direction. It's going about 60,000 revolutions per minute. Right? And what we do is we put, a, if you're looking down here, down from the top, you would be seeing something like this. All right? And I have an image of the actual rotor. You're looking at this, and you have a protein sample in here. Right? And this rotor now, just like it says here, 60,000 RPMs, spinning really fast in a, in a really a bulletproof chamber because if this thing, at those speeds, we're talking about 300,000 times the force of gravity, right? If it, if it fractures in any way, it's gonna blow up like a bomb, right? And make a huge mess and, and damage my very good graduate students. Um, <laughs> but it is a bulletproof chamber, I may so it won't, it doesn't tend to come out. It just, you know, there's not much rough, it makes it out, All right? So the idea is, right, if you're, they, they have told me it's a tilter wheel, is that right? So the, the ride at the fair, you get in, you get in, you spin around, you set, and then the drop floor, oh God, the floor, you drop the floor out, right? You're stuck to the wall because you have that, that force pushing back on you. That's the same idea here, right? So we have, we're, we're subjecting our protein to a centrifugal force that goes in this direction, okay? If you were in this, though, you'd be, your chest would be crushed because we're talking thousands of times the force of gravity because we're going to spin a very tiny molecule down, right? Now, that last slide about absorbance, Right. What we do here is we shine a light up onto this mirror and reflect it down, and we can detect how much light's going in, we can detect how much light coming out, so we can monitor the concentration along this radial pathway, right? Because this thing's spinning really fast, but light, well, it's traveling at the speed of light, right? So it passes right through there with no problem, like the instrument's not even, or like the rotor's not even moving. And what we get from this kind of experiment, well, it's like this. Uh, it's basically a particle in a wind tunnel, right? If you want to get information about aerodynamics of this sports car, you stick it in a wind tunnel and put air over it with some smoke in it so you can see what's going on. If that car wasn't there, we could get information about the shape and the drag and so on and so forth and make predictions about it. And that's what we do with these particles by sedimenting them in, in liquid. Right? <coughs> now we monitor absorbance. You can call this concentration as a function of radial position. We won't worry about this for now. You collect this as a series of, of collect boundaries as a function of time. What you get out don't worry about the math. You get, uh, you get out of what's called a Svedberg's coefficient. What matters about this is that you have molecular weight times diffusion coefficients, which really just means you get information about the shape of the macromolecule. All right? So this will tell you whether it's hexameric or so on. Right? If, you're, if you're a sausage inside of here, you're going to sediment differently than if you're a, a hamburger or if you're a tennis ball. Right? That, that just makes sense. It's gonna, the drag is going to be different. And so we can get information about the shape. We do these experiments on clip A. And this is now as a function of time, so each of these is collected every four minutes. All the particles move down, we analyze them. What it tells us, each of these peaks represents really, we'll call it a state for now. But what we found through detailed analysis of this and several other types of experiments was in fact, clip A was not in a monomer dimer equilibrium, rather it was in monomers and tetramers. And so we showed, we published this in 2009, um, we, we, that analytical centrifugation technique that I told you is two types of experiments we can do. We did both of those along with a technique called uh, dynamic light scattering. And all those techniques put together say that clip A was actually assembling it to monomers and tetramers. Now, if there were dimers there, we couldn't detect them. All right? So light scattering work was done by Ryan staff <coughs> was here as well. Uh, Keith was a former graduate student and simply subsequently graduated. Um, we went on to look at the temperature dependence because that allowed us to redistribute the tetramers, and we found actually that there were dimers, just not very highly populated. So what we concluded through these two papers was that clip A actually assembled into monomers, dimers, and tetramers. All right. We went on, and this, this embodies uh, Keith's dissertation. Uh, we published another paper on, now had to move forward from that to say, well, what happens when we add back a nucleotide? One of the other hypotheses, wasn't a hypothesis, it was an assertion. The other assertion in the field was that when Clip A bound, when clip A hexamer is bound to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, the hexamers fell apart. The data wasn't really clear as to why that was. So we analyzed the system in the presence of ADP and ATP, and what we showed actually is that in a variety of different nucleotides, clip A will form hexamers, but those hexamers are not able to bind and recognize the peptides. So it always forms hexamers and doesn't disassemble them in the presence of ADP. And so that was also an important conclusion there, which used some of our activity assays. So we later 
we published, a, after all that work, you know, we published a, a light scattering uh, techniques paper. And now this brings me up to uh, 2013. We now, so I started all this by saying, and we couldn't understand the specificity of binding without all that information about the assembly. And so now we've been able to go back, study the binding. This is work that was done by Town League. She's also here today. Um, extensively studied polypeptide binding, accounting for how the assembly state is, and she's been able to answer some of those questions, although there's a lot of substrates now that we, now that we have the technique in place, we can start to examine. Okay? And so that'll come out later this year. We got favorable reviews back just recently. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about one more technique, because I'm a kineticist as well as a thermodynamicist, and so this is a, a type of kinetics approach that we developed to address these questions. Hopefully I can do this just five more minutes. All right, so um, this is a schematic of the polypeptide substrate that we use for translocation experiments. And the questions we're after is really those of pressivity, how far does the, the um, protein go per turnover of the engine, and rates of translocation, right? So again, we, based on all the work I just told you, we know how to put a hexamer on the end of a polypeptide chain. And what this sequence of letters represents is just a specific binding sequence for clip A. On the opposite end is, is a molecule called fluorescein. So everybody's familiar with fluorescein, you probably just don't know it, um, because when they go to the optometrist and they put that stuff in your eye to dilate it, that's fluorescein. It's a, it's a dye uh, that fluoresces. Uh, for these purposes, I'll just say that this is like, as if you have a, maybe a flashlight at the end of a, uh, uh, some sort of string or something like that. Right? So it's emitting light. Okay? When the protein binds here, and this is severely exaggerated because this is about 500 times as large as this substrate. So in fact, it's, think of it more like a, uh, a gorilla standing on a shoestring and would be interacting with all ends of the shoestring, right? And so when it binds, the, the light is reduced. And so when it falls off, therefore, the light's going to come back. And so we can use that as a probe for translocation. All right. This is a schematic of, of an instrument called a stop flow fluorometer. And so what we have is two syringes. In the first syringe, we have that assembled complex. We're not worried about the words there. It's basically this, all right? And when that enzyme is bound, that light is reduced from that fluorophore. We're going to rapidly mix that with ATP so that the translocation process starts. Okay. All right, so with these two syringes, we can rapidly mix them in about two milliseconds. All right, so if anybody has ever, I'm sure everybody's fiddled with a stopwatch, right? So you have a stopwatch, and then you have seconds going by one, two, three, four. And then the tenths of a second's going by so fast you can barely see it. Well, this is another decimal place over and yet another decimal place over, right? So we're talking uh, uh, thousands of them have passed just in me trying to explain the time scale, right? So <coughs> two milliseconds is, is really, really fast, okay? Enzymatic reactions happen on the millisecond time scale, so it's a good time scale to be looking at, right? So we rapidly mix these, and what we're expecting to happen is that this is going to start trans up. This is T0, so that means that before the reaction starts. Rapidly mix with ATP. ATP is going to bind, hydrolyze, get hydrolyzed. It's going to move along. This enzyme is going to move along until it falls off, and then the light's going to get, get bright, right? Simple. Now, what we actually see experimentally is for a short polypeptide, 12 amino acids, 12 of those building blocks that we talked about, is low signal initially, and then you get recovery of that signal. But as we start to extend the length of that substrate, now 12 to 30, add another 18 amino acids, we see that there's a little bit of an inflection point here, right? But now it's more pronounced here. We're at the 40, 40 amino acids. We've extended it longer. We see a lag. And now a longer lag for 50. Okay? And so what does that mean? Well, you see a lag in recovery of that signal. And so what that tells you is that the enzyme is spending more time on the substrate as it gets longer. And that's a reflection of how many steps it takes before it falls off. Now, we can write down these complex schemes. And we can write down all the differential equations and solve them and come up with equations that describe it. And the equation that describes it actually is fitting all of these. You can't see it's a little red line there. And so the data are well described by that model, and I won't go into the details of that. The main detail I want to talk about is this, we measure the step size to be about 14 amino acids per step. So it goes 14 amino acids per step. And it does this at about 19 or, or 19 plus or minus 1, so about 20 amino acids per second. And so the exciting thing about this work, and we actually published this in JMB in 2010, was one, it's the first time anybody ever measured the step size for this type of motor protein, which is a fundamental parameter that people want to know to ultimately make one of those movies, for example. Um, two, we overcame that problem of passing the string right, through the ring, right, because we're able to detect translocation, and that substrate enters and leaves the reaction without being modified in any way. 
Uh, so the, the editor asked us to make an image for the cover of the journal. That was pretty exciting uh, since it had failed at Science and Nature. We thought it was bigger than it was, but you know. And we got this out of it, so I'm happy. And then we, it, she also invited somebody to write a, a commentary on the manuscript. So it was, it was a pretty good finding for us, so that's good. All right. That led to working out a lot of the mathematics that describe these time courses that we later published in Methods and Entomology. And now again, in similar sort of spirit as the last slide, up to modern day, this paper was also submitted in February. And so now what we've been able to do is say, okay, we're gonna add back that proteolytic component. And since we know the mechanism for the motor by itself, we can start asking questions about what that proteolytic component does to the motor, does it change it? And all these assertions that have been made about how the motor translocates in the, in the presence of clip B, are they correct? And as it turns out, what we see, and let me draw your attention down here, um, what we see when we add back the, the, uh, the protease is that the enzyme actually steps about two to five amino acids per step instead of that 14. So the step size is radically affected by the presence of the protease now. We have a model for what we think is going on. Uh, in the case of clip A, when the protease isn't there, I told you there was actually two ATP binding sites per uh, monomer unit. Um, one, we think one of them is more active than basically the other, and so that step size changes. Uh, so the main point, though, is that the, the mechanism is affected by the protease. Right? Now, one last piece of, of data, not really a whole lot of data, but really to say that now this is the work that, that Tao Lee's been working on. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. This is all Justin Miller's work, um, so he, he's getting ready to graduate, and I'll mention that again in the acknowledgments. Uh, but Tao Lee has then said, well, of course, she came, she came in the lab, and I said, okay, um, you know, we've got this great method worked out for how to study translocation. People think that clip B translocates. It's straightforward. You know, go do these experiments now on clip B and we'll publish a really great paper. Well, three or five years later, we finally, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just never as simple as you think. And so it wasn't as simple as we thought. And a lot of people had already concluded that it translocates. But when we put this in a, this enzyme, a very, again, hexameric ring, very similar. Um, in our translocation assay, this is clip A now. We see that nice lag. In the case of clip B, we never see anything that indicates it's actually processively translocating, meaning it takes multiple steps. Okay. This is only one tiny piece of data. Tau has done a great deal more that really shows that, that it's uh, not a processive uh, translocase in the way that clip A is. And we can put that together. All right. So that's where we're at. And uh, I just want to acknowledge my students again, Tao Lee, Jai Bei Lin, and Justin Miller, they're all about to uh, reach escape velocity and move <laughs> to the former lab members, uh, or the former lab members that did some of this work with Perky Jendar, he was a former postdoc, and Keith, who got his PhD, as I mentioned. Elizabeth Duran and Clarissa Lever, they're uh, second year students in my lab working very hard on different things, and Ryan Stafford, who I also mentioned, all here today. Um, and I have a couple of undergrads working very hard, and, and a high school student that is currently having his mind blown by the rigors of actual research for our conversation. Um, but he's great. He's, he's a smart guy. Okay. I, I'm sorry it took so long, but I, I'll gladly take questions. Yeah, the, the main, so the, the original objective was to use the CLIP AP, the bacterial model, to start to develop methods to study CLIP B, where we hopefully other people can use that information to introduce them into to, you know, model systems or human cells that can actually disrupt the protein aggregates. Right? So we ourselves don't actually work directly on the disease state. Right, so like uh, of human or malaria system has a proteasome uh, that uh, can be right. And uh, how similar it is to clip proteins? Ah, yeah, okay. So the proteasome, that's another direction we hope to, to move towards in the long term. <coughs> One reason we didn't start there is because the proteasome is made up of something like 36 to 40 different, different proteins. So reassembling that and doing the type of biophysics we do is difficult, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. But yes, the, the proteasome 
is made up of two hexameric motors, although each of those monomer units are different proteins uh, that associate with a central proteolytic component. So the mechanism is thought to be largely the same. But there's no reason if we can get a nice pure sample of proteasome that we couldn't do exactly the same sort of experiments that we're doing now with our system and start better quantifying the translocation mechanism for the proteasome. And that's one of the hopes, certainly. Aaron, uh, one of the central dogmas of evolution is that it doesn't produce anything it doesn't need to produce. Mm -hmm. And these proteins that serve various functions in their own particular environments in which the organisms live are presumably <coughs> optimized just for survival and reproduction. Right. So would it be um, would it be reasonable to suggest that if you were to find a temperature dependence uh, in a bacterium that lived throughout a uh, thermal gradient that the translocational speed would be a temperature dependent process number one. And, and would, would there be anything uh, of interest at the edge for what destroys the functional activity of that protein? That is, that is the, the bacteria at some point it gets to the edge of its survivability in a given thermal environment like a hot cold in, the, in the, the Yellowstone National Park. Um, and, and to learn something about how that system fails when you push it to the limits of its, its ability to deal with translocation under environmental stress. Um, sort of like heat shock protein. Right, right. so, it's, so we're maybe talking about thermophilic organisms, for yeah. example. Uh, you know, what, they def what a thermophilic organism sees as heat shock is probably different. I mean, it's already optimized to exist at the thermal vents, right? And so uh, the temperature range over which it starts overexpressing uh, heat shock proteins is probably different. Maybe a better example, since I heard this talk yesterday, was uh, for, for organisms that live in very cold environments. For whatever reason, they, they, when you look at the, the rate of growth or doubling of those organisms, they seem to have optimums, or at least fastest rate, at about 37 degrees Celsius, which is not at all where they live. Uh, but defining that as, as being the optimum probably is not a good idea, because what's going on cellularly is now that's heat shock for that organism, right? It now has upregulated all the heat shock proteins that it needs to sort of make sure that its proteome is functional and, and able to operate at 37, even though it happens to grow faster there. That's not really its optimum, right? I'm not sure if that addresses your question. Exactly. Well, I, I was thinking more of, of uh, how is how is this mode how does this motor's activity change with temperature number one, and then if you have an organism that, that it operates optimally at some temperature and you change that temperature to higher or lower, how does that affect the mechanical yeah. functionality and what happens when it starts breaking down? Yeah, we've so we. Have started to, there's a, certainly a temperature dependence. It gets faster as you raise the temperature, at least clip A does. Um, the step size stays about the same. Um, we're looking at temperature does dependencies. Does it jump tracks? I mean, uh, you know, what, what Does it make bigger steps all yeah. of a sudden? We don't see that, but that's over a limited range for, there's, there's a limit to it, how high you can go in temperature for a terrestrial sort of organism, or protein from a terrestrial organism, because you, the protein will denature at about 50, 60 degrees Celsius. So we've only gone up to about 37, maybe 40. Um, and, and we see the similar step sizes, and, and, but of course faster rate constants because everything's happening faster at higher temperature. Mm -hmm. So what's this mystery with clip B when you change the substrate dimension? You, you see some changes in your spectrum, but there is not a delay. So what is the thinking? What are the other changes in the spectrum? Well, so it, it's bound, certainly. When you mix with ATP, the, the change really is a consequence of it just falling off. It never processively moves. It, it may, we might be able to say it moves one step. Uh, maybe it tugs a little, exerts a little bit of force and falls off. That's really what we think is going on, actually, because its role is to disaggregate. And if you look across the literature at other results and the results we have, you imagine a protein aggregate there. The clip B may bind to it, tug a little bit, release, tug a little bit, release. Similar sort of unfolding mechanism just doesn't do it. That's why we say it's not a processive polypeptide translocase. There are other examples of that. These microtubules that I showed, a reaction called microtubule severing, those microtubules are made up of, of a protein called tubulin, and they have little tails sticking off of them, and there's a protein called catanin, very similar to all the proteins I talked about, binds to that tail, 
and just tugs a little bit, and that destabilizes the microtubule and it falls apart, right? So its job is to sever uh, microtubules. That's why it's named katanin, which is a Japanese mm -hmm. sword. So I missed how the bacterial system is fundamentally different from the mammalian system. I mean, in, in the mammalian system, you can, you do get rid of um, aggregates and huntingtons. Uh, they're capable of doing that if you stop their formation genetically. Um, so, so what, what is what, the, is a fundamental difference here that you've got a much smaller complex that's doing the unfolding and proteolytic activity as opposed to a proteasome? So my understanding is that, that once you have protein aggregates that are out of solution, that humans don't have a mechanism no, they, for they, they go away. Yeah. So what is that mechanism? They, they go away. And so what is the, what's the enzyme? That, is there an enzyme that does that? So the mechanism's not known. I don't uh, know whether, whether it's a proteasomic mechanism yeah. or whether it's um, autophagy. Yeah, so but, it, but they I do mean, disappear. It's, it's fairly recent papers that I've read that, that's, that there's not a disaggregating machine in metazoans like there is in plants and bacteria. That's, that's what I've read recently, so that's incorrect as of now. That's incorrect. And I wasn't aware of that. But, I'm, I'm, but then what I'm asking though, what's the fundamental difference between this system and let's say the proteasome system? Is uh, it a really smaller, a, smaller version? Simpler, a simpler version, right. So, so the proteolytic component clip P um, is one protein clip P. The uh, 26S proteasome is made up of alpha Actually, beta yeah. subunits that are, I think it's, uh, it's uh, 14 alphas and 14 betas, so there's 28 subunits inside of there. And then each of the motors are six different proteins as well, but they are what are called, I didn't mention this at all, AAA plus uh, protein unfoldases. They're highly homologous to clip A, uh, clip X for that matter, so, and clip B. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you.